HBCU Digest Radio Presidential Series. Welcome back to our conversations with distinguished chancellors and presidents of historically black colleges and universities. Uh, tonight, for the first time, far overdue, um, and certainly on uh, fault of mine and not of our guest, is the distinguished president of Wiley College, uh, the co-founder of the Higher Education Leadership Foundation, Dr. Herman Felton, um, also host of the Health uh, Podcast. So I know a lot of you guys that listen um, to the digest uh, broadcast also check out health definitely it's a, a dynamic um, piece and, and leadership uh, element to our conversation so brother president uh, uh, certainly an honor to have you on this evening man man it is an honor to be on brother I appreciate um, I appreciate you extending the invitation um, grateful to be here and, and want to thank you for being in the trenches for it's close to a decade now. How long have you been <laughs> yeah, in the trenches? It's, it's 10 man? years, man. About eight years too long. Yeah. <laughs> but we, yeah, yeah, we still, yeah. We're still in it. Well, I know <laughs> I know that those years are like uh, a dog year. Yeah. So it, it's probably <laughs> a little longer than eight. The body feels like that yeah, anyway. Man. But, yeah. Um, but, but, but thank you for having me and thank you for the work that you do, man. I appreciate it, brother. Um, So the first thing that I want to get to with you because you're so outspoken on a number of issues and we I think as a sector we appreciate it to not only have a president who's unafraid to speak to a lot of things that matter most to our sectors and to our campuses but to have a young president do it um, I think that that's we we've been waiting for that for a long time and you're certainly part of a, a cohort of young presidents that are, are growing in that in that field but you kind of um, outpace a lot of folks and being willing to talk against and for a lot of topics that people are um, you know, strategically may feel like they can't do it. Um, so in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. you're a spokesman for the HBCU presidency. Um, and in that vein, you know, I kind of want to ask you about uh, what what went down, you know, about a week ago in South Carolina with Benedict and um, certainly Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis, their great president, um, who I know with whom you're close. Um, and I hope that people listening to us now don't feel like this is two men trying to stick up for a sister um but but it, or, or try to validate can be. a sister but it, it I, can I, be. in a way i do want that uh because indeed yeah. it, is, it is our yeah. sister um yeah yeah and and we know that sisters unfairly uh catch a lot of hell um for the decisions that they make particularly in leadership positions so just from a presidential perspective because with all the talk that's still going on about this event what were your observations before, during, and after. Uh, now that we've had some days to step away from it, what do you think about that? And and from a presidential standpoint, is it something that we just we're just missing the mark on understanding what this was supposed to be and what it could have been? You know, it's a great question, and it is a dangerous um, space and topic to even to talk on. Um, and and the that in and of itself. Jared, I think, is in the theater of absurdity, right? Um, So I was actually uh, the convocation speaker that Thursday Mm -hmm. before uh, the president and other uh, presidential candidates were to be on the campus of Benedict. And I have to tell you, it's alarming. It sort of took me back to uh, our time when 80 or so of us went to the White House and the vitriol that was spewed. um, It's sort of fascinating how we talk about how how we feel about tribalism and the politics and uh, the hate that is projected. And then we turn around and practice that same hate. and uh you know meanness to to people who are certainly in the trenches working for us Mm -hmm. so you have this bipartisan or what was alleged to be a bipartisan group that has done this work for years um you know last four years uh they were on some other campus in south carolina south carolina arguably uh is the epicenter for the 2020 election mm-hmm. um, and if you know politics you understand outside of Iowa you know South Carolina is probably the place that folk are beelining making a beeline to mm-hmm. well um, this 
group comes on campus. Um, and obviously, when any president is traveling, there are certain protocols that need to be in place. I remember going online and seeing some of the stuff, and it impacted Rosalind in a way, and I, I just personally am so proud of her watching her go through what she went through with the grace and the poise um, that she has. If you know her, she's always like that, but it just exuded um, out of her pores even more. I think the more hate came her way, um, the more uh, grace she she exuded. Um, it was fascinating, Jared, to watch people um, eviscerate her uh, because they thought she recommended or she invited uh, the president there. And it's anything but. Uh, the group invited him there. He spoke. And there's this information out about eight uh, students or 10 students uh, being able to attend. Whenever the president comes into any space, the White House takes over mm -hmm. and they lay the rules. It doesn't matter what you think they are. They take over and they deploy the rules. And in that instance, there were a ton of legislators who, Republican, who were traveling and who were in that area. Tim Scott. Uh, who's the other guy? Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, right. All of those individuals and some of their top donors wanted to be in the space. That happened. It was a 270-room audience or, or auditorium somewhere around in there. And they took a, uh, took up a great deal of the seats in the space. Um, and so that happened. Um, and uh, outside of that, there were, um, unbeknownst to Roslyn, and the mayor, Steve Benjamin, I think his name is, mm -hmm. the mayor of Columbia, mm -hmm. they both were on this board. They both resigned from the board because neither of them knew that this organization wanted to award Trump with this um, honor. No idea. And so, as you can imagine, it looked as if they were complicit, which they weren't. I thought what was fascinating was the article that was done by the Palmetto Times, I think it is, the mm -hmm. Columbia paper, mm -hmm. where Rosalind sat down and really talked about uh, everything that happened. Um, so I'll stop with that and say this to transition for us. What is not, um, I think, anticipated from us inside this space who are earnestly doing this work um, with uh, no motive is when the family turns on you, mm -hmm. you know, that is more painful, Jared, than anything else. Yep. Now, <laughs> what what is mind boggling to me is that um, the bastion of democracy uh, is a college campus or should be symbolism of pure democracy should be on a camp, a college campus the introduction of democracy and a political system and how it works, I think is ripe, um, the ripe environment for that, that is on a college campus. And yet, even though there is a particular person in the White House who those um, uh, many of us do not agree with, um, at the end of the day, it is the president of the United States. HBCUs, PWIs, public, private, receive federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Education holds loans for us. They issue loans for us. Um, and I think protocol just simply um, allows for the president of the United States of America um, to pretty much go Wherever uh, he damn well pleases, right? <laughs> whatever he wants to, right. and um, 
because he comes on your campus does not mean that you acquiesce to his um, his his uh, ethos, um, the way he moves. It, it, it does not mean that. Um, and at the end of the day, I know here at Wiley, I've got a handful of Republicans uh, mm-hmm. on my campus who would be happy to see him. Should he be? Should they be denied to see the person that they believe to be their president? At the end of the day, their freedom of expression um, is only as good as um, it is comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? So if you like what I like, then we're good, and you have a right to express that. But if you hate what I like, then I'm eviscerated because I don't hold your same views and values. Mm -hmm. The very thing that we teach people to be, which is independent, free thinkers, um, is the thing that will, will get you slaughtered uh, in, in, in a lot of spaces. Man. It Do you think, and, and we kind of talked off air a little bit about this, and I asked um, Dr. Artis the same question, is it, a, is it a situation where we're just, the leaders are going to have to almost drag stakeholders kicking and screaming? into a political process because this is not going to change even when trump ex- exits there's still going to be certain engagement we have to make with whatever party is in the white house whether people like it or don't Absolutely. like it so do we have to do we have to do a better job of educating the stakeholders do you think that they can be convinced that this has to happen well here's what i believe jared i i think that we are a nation that is just absolutely experts we are experts in lazy research we pick up tired lazy tropes and we run with them they're not ours we go with the popular um the masses you know and i think most people are reasonable and because i believe that i believe to your point an educational process Um, would help most people say, you know what, I don't agree with that guy. I don't agree with it, but I understand why you're doing it. If people can push to that space, if we can educate people to be in that space, then we win. You know, we win because we don't have to worry about issuing press releases and worrying about deflections and people starting protests and uh, people who don't want to give to our institutions using that as a reason to not give, right? You, 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 you've not been giving forever and now you are, you, <laughs> you now have a built in excuses <laughs> to never give ever, ever, ever. Yeah. Right. We have to, I think your point is spot on. We have to educate folks the best we can, but here's the thing, Jared, we cannot um, spend a whole lot of time doing that. The Bible says, you know, division, uh, make it plain, write it and make it plain. Mm -hmm. All we can do is just put the information out there, and we're hoping that our alums who have been educated at our institutions, which we believe to have done a good job, will have the mental requisite to understand simple information. Well, I don't I I guess the emotion takes over because I don't get I can understand that you don't mess with Trump so hard that you can't you can't see him on your campus. I get it. But what I don't get is particularly for HBCU communities, especially in the Deep South. You think this is the first racist person we've talked to that's been on campus or you think this is the first interface we've had with 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 a political enemy? You you must not have met a mayor a while ago. You must not have met a governor a while ago. You must not have met a congressman a while ago because we've been doing this for years. And I can't emphasize the point enough. You were cool with those or you didn't know. And it didn't matter to you to find out as you talked about lazy research. So why are we we're so hyped up now? We're hyped up about Trump. We're hyped up about a George Bush statue at Hampton. We're hyped up about, you know, all kinds of stuff. We've been doing this dance for years. And everybody's been cool with it, no matter what kind of tension it created on our presidents, what kind of tension it created on our boards. Listen, I I think for me to put things in perspective, like life is so much easier now, Jared. In the <laughs> 60s and the 50s, people were dying mm-hmm. when they came uh, into uh, 
you know, into contact with individuals who didn't understand who we were and why we were on this earth and, and celebrate our excellence the way everybody should have. Right. Like, and we have brothers and sisters like John Lewis, um, you know, getting beat across the head right. uh, and many, many others who were willing to die for principle. It is so much easier now. Like you, you, you can argue this cancel culture, like, like you woke a quote unquote, I don't even know what the hell that means, <laughs> but um, like these keyboard activists, like it's so easy to say, you know, some words and, and spew, you know, mean stuff. I think it's much harder for people to sit across the table um, from people who they disagree with fundamentally and have conversations, dialogue, and we can all get up and walk away. Like, yo, I, it is very clear that our nation has a ton of work to do with respects to race relations. That very clear. I don't think anybody needs to argue that point. At what point are we going to say, it's time for us to have some tough conversations, some tough questions, and be resolved with knowing that some people will never see things the way we do, and that's okay, because they have a fundamental constitutional right to do it. I'm not saying that their right is right. I'm just saying that their right to do what they want to do is not wrong. And because of that, we've got to figure out how we get to a space where we can levitate in all climes and spaces with all kinds of people and still do what we need to do, which is stay focused. Stay focused on raising resources that allow the next generation to be equally if not better than we are with all the ranks and privileges and rights and tools that they need to, to levitate in greatness. This, these conversations take us away from that, Jared. Mm -hmm. They take us away from that, particularly when they are conversations that devolve quickly. <laughs> right? we, we're, we're arguing two minutes after we start having a conversation about Trump being on our campus mm -hmm. and and it's it is non-productive so how do we move from that how do we get to this space and say okay yeah we nobody likes Trump gotcha how do we move the cheese mm -hmm. right how do we move in uh, in a succinct fashion that allows us to have our dignity intact and our positions to be there to be heard but also not to be you know, um, uh, blatant um, uh, people who disregard the fundamental things that we're fighting for as well, right? Let's not be the pot mm -hmm. or the kettle. Let's let's be who we we need to be with 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 integrity and erect uh, spines. But let's not focus on the nonsense. And and again, I don't want to diminish how people feel. I just think that if we had conversations, if if people waited to hear what really happened, um, I think the support would have been a lot different. But we're so quick to pick up on false narratives uh, and run with them, that lazy research, that it really diminishes our capacity to really be in a disgrace space, man. Let's focus on that that point about lazy research, um, because you were um, outspoken about one of the the, the lazy researchers, um, you know, kind of hovering around our sector. That's Mary Beth Gasman. Um, yes, sir. That so you know that I think that we have tried to alert people um, about you know problematic. Uh, research and information that comes out about our sector and stuff that doesn't provide great narrative or great insight on who we are and what we're trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. And now this has been mingled with, you know, kind of a, a, a power leveraging over some of our graduates in her office. So she she moves on. She goes from Penn to Rutgers. Um, you know, she's being hypersexual with black men and women. She gets away with it mm -hmm. seemingly. Um, should, is, is it over? Uh, should we let it be over? What more can we do? 
You know, this is where um, this is where power, um, influence, uh, and all those things matter, and it also illuminates what it means to be marginalized. Um, these major institutions um, really. I don't know if they have a modicum of respect for uh, our voices. And I, I'll tell you why I say this. Uh, if the shoe were fit um, on on me um, and I were the black man um, aggrieving uh, others, um, I think that narrative would have been different because the voice of others is much louder uh, than the voice of black and brown, mm -hmm. even in higher education, mm -hmm. right? So that's been played out over and over and over again. For me, I don't particularly have a feeling about this lady one way or the other. Um, she has done a lot of research um, on HBCUs. There are some who say it's great, and then there are some who feel like it's regurgitated. It's the same thing over and over. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily lead from uh, H HBCU alumni giving to uh, somebody being an expert on board and presidential selection. <laughs> don't know how we make that gap. And I don't know how, how we give someone... Uh, the agency to be uh, the spokesperson for us. Having said that, the work was done, right? And I would always tell people, stop talking about it. You know, do something about it. If you want to change the narrative, change the narrative, right? Get in there, do the work, do what you need to do. My problem, um, in particular, there was an article that was wrote uh, and I'm going to get to your question really quickly, um, but I, I think it's important to tie all this in. There was an article when uh, the researcher announced a uh, center for um, minority leaders or something. Mm -hmm. And she quoted, um, she was quoted as saying that there was, there's never been a leadership institution for pipelines for HBCUs, and that was particularly troubling. Yeah, you, you actually wrote a piece for, for the Digest about that to say, well, let me give you about four of them. <laughs> exactly, right, right. Hey, and, and I'm not going to even mention health. Right. And when I wrote an article, I didn't even mention health because there was no reason to even um, tank it as if it were about me and the work that we were doing because we are peons with respect to what Edison or Jackson has done, 15 presidents he's made, Harvey is 10 plus, um, Dorothy Yancey, Jimmy Jenkins, Haywood Strickland, like you, Harold Martin, like you can go on and on about individuals who have done work themselves. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about what Hampton did with a presidential leadership institute. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what Nacio did. So those things for me, being a researcher at a Carnegie One designated research institution, or however they say that, a simple Google query, <laughs> not Google Scholar, a simple Google query, mm -hmm. uh, HBCU leadership would have popped up a litany of stuff. Mm -hmm. So for people to feel that comfortable, to say that there has never been one of these, suggests two things. Either you have no regard for the work that we've done, or you don't even give a damn mm -hmm. that we might call you out on it. And it is not factual information. Now, fast forward, what is troubling for me is not what she did, that there's issue there, but the response of the institutions. Mm -hmm. that, that, to me, has been the most unsettling. And again, I'm not trying to take any food from anybody, uh, any money out of anybody's pocket, I just want people to really understand these instances should be about teaching us and reminding us 
about how marginalized we are and how seemingly powerless uh, we are and how voiceless we are. Because I can assure you, the little bit of money that I'm paid at Wiley, I'd be willing to bet if the shoe were on the other foot, not only would this be a dead issue, it would be a dead issue because said individual would be a non-employee. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just plain and simple. And so from there, what do you gather from there? And the stories, like I, I didn't read the stuff, but I heard you've been in enough spaces and places um, that people had a ton of respect for her, and some still do. Um, and they felt like that was the, their entree what she had was their entree into higher education and to publishing and, and all these things. And so, you know, I think we have to be, um, you know, vocal in ways that don't really put us in this position where we're going after a person. I think the collateral damage for me is enough for us to talk about. And, and what also troubles me is that um, the name Proctor is is something that uh, he's in the stratosphere of his own. You talking to Samuel Proctor, Samuel, Jerry Rutgers, yeah. Samuel DeWitt Proctor is in a completely different stratosphere, Jerry. Mm-hmm. This brother was magnanimous in politics, in higher education, in activism, and in religion, mm-hmm. like he was par excellent in all those spaces, and most of us mere mortals are happy to to have impact in just one area. This brother was bad in four different areas, mm-hmm. and the Jeremiah Wrights, the Calvin Butts, the Matthew Wadleys, the administrators in higher education, the students who benefited from. Um, work study, which he advocated for and testified um, for, um, um, trio programs, like all the stuff that he did is still impacting us to this day. So to have a person who is blemished or who has been accused of doing things that are counter to who he was, I mean, I took, you know, a little bit issue there as well. So, you know, for me, it just says in a lot of different ways the value of black and brown. Um, it says uh, it, it amplifies uh, the fact that we have no voice or our voice doesn't necessarily matter. And folks are happy that it was a two or three day um, type story and, and keep the party moving. I mean, that's what those institutions were banking on. I'm certain um, she's happy that, that, you know, the wind has blown over. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we have to be vigilant about this space, man. We have to be vigilant about this space. They might be being quiet. They might be yelling about Rosalind at this point. But they, I don't think people, a lot of people haven't, for, <laughs> haven't forgotten that. And, they, and there <laughs> well, will come a time when a report comes out or something happens and this will cycle back. So certainly... You know, our, our our sector may be quiet sometimes. We don't forget easily. Um, yeah. let, let's cycle that to health. Um, now, you guys have had several cohorts um, of the of the training uh, initiative um, that has given extraordinary uh, space and platform for presidents to get together and talk, for VPs to get together and talk, um, and for other high level administrators to learn from each other and um, really draw on wisdom from this sector. And it's very different from places like Case and Askew, um, even MLI, which is a good one, um, you mm-hmm. know, under Charlie mm-hmm. Nelms and Mary Saez. Um, mm-hmm. but, but, but what's very different is you don't, you, you, this is almost HBCU exclusive. And all of the pitfalls and all of the, all the triumphs that, you know, presidents could share and, peop- and administrators could share happen here at Health. And Health has produced some presidents over recent years. So it's well on its way to, to, if not already being our premier um, training, training ground for HBCU presidents. Now, when you look around higher education, which is getting a lot of attention, um, NCAA is changing and athlete resources are changing. We're also seeing 
um, Hallelujah. Issues, Hallelujah. <laughs> issues about uh, recruitment um, and how students get into college, how parents can buy the, their the students' way into college. What mm-hmm. What do you do with health when you see <laughs> with health when you see higher education as an industry changing so quickly? And you know that for HBCUs, this is going to have dramatic repercussions. What does that do for the founders, for you and George French um, and other folks and and Melva and everybody who helps to shape this program? How do you digest all these changes and say, now, this is what the next cohort is going to need to know? Man, um, thank you for the plug, brother. We uh, it's exhaustive, right? Because every day, uh, several times a day, there there are things, policies, policies. scandals that are impacting uh, the way in which we should be leading. Um, you mentioned MLI, ASCU, CASE, all those places, CIC, all those places are great. Mm-hmm. Um, Harvard, even Harvard. Um, but I have found myself wanting and needing something more, right? I need, I need the best practices, but I also need um, the duct tape approach. Um, and and I don't mean that we're different and, and deficient. I, things just hit a little different at these HBCUs. Mm-hmm. They, you know, we, we're servicing a populace that is different, and our boards um, they govern differently. Mm-hmm. And so, people who are coming up, and you know, this is probably tough to hear, but we're we're patriarchal with, with respects to the presidency, right? It's almost. I mean, you're, you're kind of treated like the pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you don't understand the rules, you can hurt yourself before you get an opportunity to change them. Mm-hmm. And so we're we're really about freshening up things and giving people a look behind the curtain. But we also really want to talk about um, what it means to be in this space. Right. This is a privilege to be serving at an HBCU because of the mission, the way in which these places were founded, Jared. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you can't take lightly hovering around these campuses are nothing but ancestors in the clouds that are whispering and carrying these institutions because mm-hmm. there's a whole bunch of dumb stuff that goes on, <laughs> not only at these institutions, but others. And you think to yourself, like, how do these places continue to make it? It's the ancestors, man, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but health is really about strengthening the pipeline. And when we started it, it was about, okay, where do we find a place to coalesce around this idea that we're brilliant, our institutions are brilliant, we want to reverse the brain drain, and we want to we want to help people who are committed to being in this space understand that they this place will will challenge you, and those challenges won't be any different if you flight and go to a PWI, mm-hmm. right? Because people are running the institutions, so it's not the institutions that are problems. It's the people who are doing that, and I submit to folk that people are the same everywhere. Mm-hmm. They they might do it a little sneakier, they might do it a little more grimier, uh, they might be a little more outspoken, but at the end of the day, lazy people are everywhere, and <laughs> conniving people are everywhere. And and by the same token, excellent people are everywhere as well. We believe that the solution to the challenges in the network, the network being HBCUs, are right here in the HBCU space. Mm-hmm. We w- have took a lot of flack about being HBCU-centric, and we don't care. Like, we're not about making money for health. We're not trying to monetize health. We are seriously about making sure that there's a pipeline that continues to recycle itself, and I don't mean bad actors or or whatever, but just a you know a recycling of fresh, um, highly skilled transformational leaders from one place to another. You leave Wiley and you go be great at Morgan. You mm-hmm. leave Morgan and you go be great at Howard, uh, etc. So the idea is to strengthen the pipeline, one. Number two, um, we have, we've had to recalibrate health, um, and it is amazing. I remember the first time we did health, Jared, we had like nine people who 
um, who signed up and paid to come. And then we gave out like 16 scholarships mm-hmm. because people were like, oh, that's a black little thing. Is it help? Is it health? Is it him? Is it harm? Like, what? what is it? You know, <laughs> what, what, what are we, what are we coming to? Yeah. And, um, and so I'll never forget by the time the first day alpha cohort left, we had almost 30 applications waiting for the beta cohort. Mm-hmm. And we are so, um, so grateful now that the word of mouth precedes us, our reputation precedes us, and that we we really don't even, like, like right now for the Capital or we opened up the application portal for a month, and we, we got almost 100 applications, 107, I think it was, mm-hmm. um, for 35 slides. Mm-hmm. And it's just growing, but what we've learned, Jared, is that we had to split up and take it from just the Leadership Institute with um, without bifurcating to bifurcating. So we now have the senior folks, the vice presidents and above, um, chief of staffs and provosts, while they're at the same institute, we expose them to folks who will help them with that next step. Mm-hmm. And the AVPs, et cetera, they just go through the regular track, which is good with an eye on that next step as well, but more so on being great where you're at. Because I believe the, the, the quickest way to get to where you want to go is to be excellent where you are. Mm-hmm. And you'll get where you want to go really quickly if you keep your head down and be great. But so we did that. The other thing that we had um, to recognize is that we were getting a lot of applications from people who were just starting their careers. Mm-hmm. And so in January, um, we're going to be announcing something big that um, we think will help us um, really shore up the pipeline from the beginning of the pipeline to the end of the pipeline. Um, and I, I might as well tell you now, it's it's going to be an institute for um, individuals who are directors and below. Hmm. Um, okay. And and yeah, and 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 we're that will be called emerge. Uh, and I think Charlotte is where it's going to be. Um, but what we're going to do is simply take the simple notion that when freshmen come into um, to, 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 to Morgan State, your alma mater. Mm-hmm. Um, they're advised. They get freshmen, their first year experience. They are guided through that first year, right? Think about the amount of people who come to HBCUs in the low level management, mid level management space who get no guidance. Mm-hmm. They show up. And they tell you, here's your job, and you're going to do the job. You're not indoctrinated into the culture. You don't know what to expect. You're not told that, you know, things, um, the decorum, um, how to really uh, grasp a culture, how to motivate people to get them to understand if they are in the right place. You came in in financial aid, but you really should be in student affairs or mm-hmm. You know, you came in as a recruiter, but you should be in advancement, helping raise money. Like, we are going to put together an institute that really speaks to professional development for people who are really not even thought about. And when we did a study at our own institutions that looked at the turnover, Mm -hmm. most of our turnover is from individuals who've been at our institutions from zero to five years. Oh yeah, it's constant. Oh yeah, and your eyes this this constant from so from people who love the sector, there. who wanted to be there, and got absolutely dissuaded by. Absolutely. Oh my God, is this absolutely. what I ran into? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. And so we thought, like, okay, we're talking about the pipeline, but we're just talking about the front end of the pipeline. Mm-hmm. We need to address the entire pipeline. And I had this sister, Erica McCray, who is. Um, a brilliant sister down at the University of Florida. She's a, um, a specialist in higher education, I mean, um, special education. Mm-hmm. And she was helping us with the mission statement for health. And she said, your mission statement has to be so bold that people think you're crazy. Mm-hmm. And our mission statement is to be the preeminent leadership institute in America. 
that focuses on HBCUs. I don't have not one problem with a PWI. I went to University of Florida for law school. I'm actually at Southern Methodist University now getting a master's in theology. I don't have a problem with those institutions, but they have everything that they need and more. Mm -hmm. My lot on this earth is about HBCUs. And so I think I have to do my part to make sure that the best and the brightest stay home, that they are attracted to where we are, and that we help people find agency uh, while they're while they're practicing their vocation. That's our that's our responsibility, Jared. Yours too, and everybody else who's around here talking about they love HBCUs. <laughs> you love them. Your job is to make sure that they're around this piece forever, For their right? Because when one of them dies, um, it, it hurts all of us. It, it does. So, so in a nutshell, health is a leadership institute. Five of us have been through health, have went on to become presidents. We have health by the numbers on our website. Over 30 folks have risen to the vice presidency um, and up to the provost. Like the beautiful thing about it, bro, is like it's tribalism now mm -hmm. in a cool in a cool way. We started out, folks, the alpha, the beta cohorts we get somewhere around i think the iota no the ada the ada cohort called themselves the greater ada so they now have a line <laughs> and, and we were going through the pinning ceremony there this is crazy we're going through the pinning ceremony and they're like oh no we got to get a lot down. like you gotta who's number one who's number three these folks were jockeying it is hilarious. Y'all went full. Y'all went full Greek. Y'all went pledging on them. <laughs> they, have, we, they have went pledging on their own selves, right? So it, it's greater Ada. Then Mo Better Theta came out um, with, and then you got the iconic Iota. I mean, these people like it is so beautiful to watch strangers come into a cohort model. And the reason why we only do so many is because we think it is so important for people to have that organic process. We have people who are being mentored by presidents now, and they do it on their own. Mm -hmm. I'm not assigning a mentor to you. That's that's hogwash. Go find one because you might get you mm -hmm. might get with me, and I am I'm straight no chaser. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, nah, pimp. It is not time for you to be a president right now. You think it is, but it's not that time. If you can't handle that, I'm not the right mentor for you. I'm not the right sponsor for you, mm -hmm. right? So those things, we believe, have to happen organically. But, man, let me tell you something. These cohort members are employing each other. They're bringing each other in um, to conduct training for them because there's so many brilliant brothers and sisters in this space, man, that – Again, the challenges can be met with the solutions right here in the network, and we're we're creating, you know, practitioners and and folks who are um, really serious about doing the work. And these uh, communities of practice are just the folks who are excellent. Um, and so health has really did things that we never thought it would do. And we've got to now take it out of the garage and put it in brick and mortars. You know, we've been running this bug like Sunday at nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. We get together, me, Melva Turner, who's the chancellor, uh, and the vice chancellor at Southern University Shreveport. Greg D is the young brother who has been with me personally from Livingstone to Wilberforce, now at Wiley. Uh, President French down at Clark Atlanta and President Pinkard, who is at Wilberforce, um, we get together on a Sunday night at 9 o'clock. We don't interfere with our day jobs. We do this work at nighttime, bro. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very passionate about it and committed about it. And um, we're getting ready to announce a partnership that uh, we're finalizing um, in any day now. Um, we should be able to go public with it, but it's, it's going to give us um, agency again to really put a stake in the ground and, and make claim to um, to folk that uh, training for HBCUs is in good hands uh, with us and our new partner. 
let's round out the the conversation with how that kind of training and that kind of camaraderie and coalition manifests on campus, right? So, in the, I don't think it's off putting to say the brief tenure at at Wiley. Um, you've already done something dramatic. This is something that a lot of schools are are examining how to do. Some of them have launched it. Uh, uh, Dr. Artis at Benedict and uh, Chris Brown at Kentucky State, which is lowering tuition. Um, yes, sir. And for the layperson, it would seem counterproductive. Like, right? Okay, we you're going to reduce the cost, and that makes sense. But how does the school stay open? And this is something that you've mm-hmm. launched through the Wiley Cares Initiative, which doesn't just stop at college affordability and access but it really speaks to retention and continuation or matriculation and how do you really make the most of the collegiate experience at wiley college talk a little bit about wiley cares and how that was developed and what it takes for a leadership infrastructure to do something like that board and all you know um if you are to pay attention if you say you are paying attention to um, the students that you serve, then it would be injurious to the institution and the student for us to have um, things like hunger after seven o'clock. You know, our calf closes, uh, we're in a small town and these kids don't have transportation. Um, and you know, life is starting at seven o'clock. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so these kids are, you know, having a, a completely different day after the seven o'clock hour. And now they're trying to figure out what do they eat at? Mm-hmm. So we recognize that not just at Wiley, but all across America, hunger is a problem on college campuses at Harvard, at, at, Duke at UNC Chapel Hill and at our HBCUs. It's, you know, it's, you can pick it up in the Chronicle and see it every day. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to address that. Micro grants, we thought about micro loans and we thought, well, they can't be loans because they don't have money to pay back. So are we going to be to a predatory lender and, and charge <laughs> kids, you know, interest rate on, right. on a little $50, $100 loans? Right. But kids need, um, toiletries and they need to be able to wash their clothes Mm -hmm. um the 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 wash um aspect of it is free but detergent is not right right? so our washer and dryers are free but we have kids who don't have resources uh and and i don't want to broad brush broad brush um our campus these aren't all of them but all of our kids matter Mm -hmm. so we have to address all of them so we're we're going to be giving out starting in january micro grants that allow kids to you know get a hundred dollars where they demonstrate need um that will help them uh get through i was talking to a kid at dillard who had 75 dollars. they get 75 dollars on their meal card mm-hmm. to buy food, extra food in the evening. And she was like, I still have $55. I, I can make that last the whole semester. Like mm-hmm. I, I have my meals and then I have $75 to go in the bookstore or do this or do that. And that put me in a great space of knowing that it doesn't get take a lot. hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah that, that, that can stretch um, the wise ones that can stretch them for a while. So we, we have to do that. So you had food pantry, micro grants to help people uh, have some dignity about themselves. Mm-hmm. And and then we we lowered tuition. So we looked at the data, and for us, a student from the state of Texas who is pale dependent, not pale eligible, because they're going to take it, they, they are pale dependent, mm-hmm. and they get Texas money, the maximum amount for a freshman is $16,600 with the EFC of zero, expected family contribution of zero. Mm-hmm. So that means we cannot expect a penny, not one red iota to come from their family mm-hmm. to help them finance their, their education. Our tuition was 21000 So what we were seeing was this crippling effect of contributing to the crushing debt that students have. But more importantly, you get through your first semester you got to come back and clear business and finance, and we expect you to have four thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Well, kind of don't have that. Mm-hmm. So now you have this balance that keeps building up, 
and you pay a little bit off here, you pay a little bit off there, but you get down to graduation and you've you got twelve to fifteen thousand dollars that you owe the college, as well as whatever debt you may have fifteen twenty thousand that you owe the Department of Education. And that's not to mention the penalties that Department of Education levies against the school for quote unquote not collecting balances. That's the part nobody. Thank hears you about. very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, because your audit, the aging accounts receivables, will kill you. Right, it will crush you, um, and you carry bad debt just as if you were in your personal space carrying bad debt. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to get, you know, any any decent financing, right? So it really is about doing our part to crush, um, to eliminate the crushing debt. And then the other thing that we're doing is um, we have this these two other things, rather, reclamation. Um, we are looking at students. We had 368 people who left us between 18 and 19, uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, who, who stopped out because of finances. Mm -hmm. And so what we're saying to them since for one year we had to write off all the debt is you can come back to college if you are still um, aid available, uh, financial aid, we will hold that debt and we will liquidate that debt at the end of your career, uh, provided you come back to Wiley and graduate. Mm. Mm. So in other words, if you dropped out and you got $13,000, we'll let you back in. You shouldn't amass that kind of debt anymore because the tuition is lower. You should be able to you know, meet the need still have some skin in the game. The delta between uh, tuition and what they can get um, is about $900. Mm -hmm. So we, we still want you to have some some skin in the game and figure out how you can do, how you can close that gap. But that gap won't be as, it won't be $4,500 every semester. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you come back, you graduate, we take that $13,000 and forgive it. Mm -hmm. That's our way of, of giving people an opportunity to get out of the vicious cycle that we find ourselves in when we don't have uh, the agency of education uh, behind us when we walk into doors um, and how we can help create um, stoppage of the vicious cycle as well. Because most of our students are first generation. And then the last thing we're doing is allowing some of our kids, <laughs> they want to work off that debt. Mm -hmm. And so places like physical plant and public safety, uh, not work study, but giving them an opportunity to make, you know, eight to 10 bucks an hour uh, to come and help uh, do some of the things that would free up our security officers to go do things like go check the dorms or the buildings, the classrooms faces to make sure they're locked or drive a golf cart and give a young lady a ride from one end of the campus to the other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, things like that. Um, giving them an opportunity to work off their debt as well. So we're thinking of creative ways to help solve the problem. But our kids are screaming um, in the nation. Our kids are no different from the nation, but this debt uh, makes kids wonder whether or not it's worth it. And I submit to anybody across the nation, a liberal arts education is well worth the investment. You have to reframe the narrative. It's not debt. It's an investment in itself, uh, but it's well worth it. And it puts you in places uh, simply because you have that ticket, that check box, um, allows you to be uh, in the conversation for so many things than if you did not have it. And so for that alone, I, I find it to be well worth it. And not to mention that, you know, on average, a high school graduate makes a million dollars less over their life than a person who has a college degree. Fantastic stuff, bro. As 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 usual, man. We appreciate the time. Before we get out of here, please, 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 uh, plug the the website for health. Uh, let folks know about the next uh, cycle of applications and um, where folks can can download and subscribe to the uh, Four Thoughts of Our Founders podcast. My man, um, thank you, Jared. Uh, first, let me let me just say that I, I appreciate uh, uh, the passion and the advocacy. Uh, that you deploy, um, and um, and a lot of times, uh, folk 
may not feel um, it may not be comfortable to hear what you have to say. <laughs> um, but you know, I, our our space is not uh, free from criticism. Um, but we just have to make sure that we are all. Um, it's clear that everybody wants everybody to win. Um, so I appreciate your advocacy and both um, your your keen eye on on what you feel. Um, things that should happen and shouldn't happen. So I, I, I appreciate that. Health, our website is H-E Leaders, H-E-L-E-A-D-E-R-S dot org. Uh, our next institute, um, close your ears when you hear this, brother, but the Kappa cohort. Um, <laughs> I know you took too much pride in that one, bro. <laughs> but you know where you started. <laughs> the, the Kappa, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We appreciate the blueprint, brother. We appreciate, we appreciate, or rather, as one of my LPs would say, we appreciate the rough draft. Don't forget, I put um, y'all pitch up, man. I, it was not too long yeah. ago. I said our cap is our cap is taking all the presidencies, and the alphas got no, mad at me. But you got to You got to tell the truth. <laughs> Listen, dude, and so many of y'all, man, I, I, Roderick Smothers is, you know, always letting folk know, uh, but it is, man, it's a, uh, it might be 15 or 20 al- alpha presidents, man. You got to, you got to um, give the credit know, where it's due. The Kappas, I mean. I, I do. You know, the Q's, you know, the Q's yeah, are still short, but the cap I mean, the Kappas are, are, are doing their thing. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't really deny it. I mean. It's still brothers. Yeah, yo. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we are. We are. But the Kappa cohort will be in December, uh, December 12th through the 15th uh, at Wiley College, at my college. Um, and so I'm really happy about that. And the next uh, institute uh, will be in June. Um, and we're tossing up between Virginia Union and uh, Charlotte, so we're not quite sure, but we will know in December uh, where the location is. But the uh, website and the application will be open uh, the first day of the Capital Court, which will be December 12th. Uh, so again, www.heleaders.org. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's where it is there. And I appreciate the platform. And I appreciate you uh, giving me uh, uh, an opportunity to come and just kick it with you, man. This is fun. And you can find us, our our podcast, uh, on Apple um, at uh, Four Thoughts of Our Founders. 